welcome back at the Sri Lanka case hearing of the People's Tribunal on the murder of journalists. I now call the next witness, Mrs. Nusheen Sakarati. Mrs. Sakarati, thank you very much. Could you briefly introduce yourself for the tribunal and your work at the Center for Justice and Accountability? Um, of course, and thank you so much for inviting me here, and uh, thank you to the panel for presiding over these hearings. Uh, my name is Nusheen Sarkarati. I've been a senior staff attorney with the Center for Justice and Accountability um, for 12 years now, uh, where I've been litigating human rights cases primarily in U.S. courts and before international bodies. Um, I'm currently on leave from the Center for Justice and Accountability and working for Human Rights Watch's International Justice Program, but um, the information I'll be discussing today is based on my work at the Center for Justice and Accountability and the case that we filed on behalf of Ahimsa Wikramatunga. Could you provide a short outline of your activities, your work that you performed on behalf of the family of Mr. Wikramatunga? So my organization, CJA, has long been looking at Sri Lanka and options for justice uh, that may exist outside of the country. Um, we opened up investigations back in 2013, um, looking at possible cases that could be filed in the United States. Um, but it wasn't until 2016 that the family of Lasanta Wikramatunga reached out to us for assistance. Um, they wanted to understand better what their options were to pursue accountability through universal jurisdiction. At that time, a case was proceeding um, within Sri Lanka, a, a criminal investigation was proceeding within Sri Lanka, um, and we were monitoring the developments of that criminal investigation. Uh, we also started collecting open source information around Lasanta's death. Um, and we started uh, collecting declassified government documents, um, UN reporting, human rights reporting, uh, and also the B reports that were issued by Nishanta De Silva in court uh, within Sri Lanka, which was the summaries of the investigations that he was giving uh, repeatedly to the judges uh, throughout the proceedings of his investigation. Uh, but because we believed that the case was moving forward in Sri Lanka, um, we just kept an eye and developed the investigation. But it wasn't until 2018 that it became clear that Sri Lanka was no, not really a viable jurisdiction for accountability. Uh, and that's when we started to take seriously putting together a universal jurisdiction case on behalf of Lasanta's family. Uh, and in 2019, we filed a case against Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who at that time was a civilian. He was the former Secretary of Defense. Uh, he was traveling to the United States, uh, and we served him personally when he was in California with the lawsuit. Can you describe what other steps you took um, outside of Sri Lanka and outside of the US? So we were exploring what options were available for Ahimsa's family and, you know, although the international community had invested a lot of investigative effort on Sri Lanka, there were few options available outside of the country. Um, you know, there were individual communications that victims could make before certain treaty bodies like the Convention Against Torture or the ICCPR. But Sri Lanka hadn't ratified the Rome Statute. It wasn't within the jurisdiction of the ICC. And there had long been effort um, seeking a Security Council referral before the ICC, but that uh, wasn't developing. Uh, there were other organizations, too, that were looking at universal jurisdiction cases in Europe. Um, but we focused on the U.S. because Gotabaya Rajapaksa was actually a U.S. citizen at the time he was committing these abuses. Uh, we were alerting the Department of Justice, which has a specialized war crimes unit known as the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Unit, um, that Gotabaya was traveling back and forth to the U.S. Uh, we were directing their attention to various uh, reporting, identifying his alleged war crimes, um, and pointing out the fact that the U.S. had jurisdiction and the laws to be able to prosecute him. But it wasn't until we 
went through all these efforts before we decided to take a civil, the civil suit forward. Can you describe for the tribunal the obstacles that you faced in the course of your civil litigation in the U.S.? Well, it's very difficult for a victim uh, to be able to find attorneys, investigate these claims on their own, even with an NGO like ours. Um, we are a non-governmental organization. We don't have the same resources that government entities do. So even tracking perpetrators, um, we have to rely on things like social media and open source to be able to identify locations. Um, luckily, Gotabaya Rajapaksa was a heavy Twitter user, so we were able to follow him somewhat uh, and identify his location that way. Um, but because this is a civil suit, we're also dealing with the fact that um, we can't provide witness protections, um, so it's difficult to find victims and witnesses that are willing to pro provide evidence um, to us uh, because we don't have those government resources to be able to relocate witnesses to testify. All of these are major obstacles to victims being able to litigate these cases themselves. Um, yet our clients are tenacious and victims and witnesses do come forward uh, to bring this evidence. Uh, and luckily we had a really strong, we had breakthroughs in the investigation within Sri Lanka that we were able to rely on in building our case in the US. Um, but once we filed the case, um, we brought on a law firm, Double Boys and Plimpton. You heard from my co-counsel yesterday, Catherine Amirfar, to assist us in litigating the complex claims that we had filed. Our case was um, alleging torture and extrajudicial killing of Lasanta Wickramatunga, but we were also trying to prove that Lasanta's murder wasn't unique. It was part of a systematic and widespread attack against journalists um, that was committed to you know, during the period in which the Rajapaksas were in power. Um, you know, we found that Lasanta's attack followed a pattern of attacks that were occurring against other journalists at that time, which was essentially journalists that dared report on corruption or human rights abuses against the government, um, would be labeled as terrorists or would be labeled as um, Tamil Tiger sympathizers. Their names would be put on a Ministry of Defense website um, they would start uh, receiving harassing letters. Um, they'd be intimidated. Several journalists would be picked up in white vans, abducted, abused, and some individuals like Lasanta would be killed. Um, so proving these types of claims, like a crime against humanity claim, was going to be a significant battle. Um, and we, were, we brought on this law firm to assist us. And Gotabaya Rajapaksa hired a very famous law firm to defend himself and brought on a massive team. Um, this, the law firm was Aiken Gump. Uh, and they immediately filed a motion to dismiss, raising several defenses to try to get the case dismissed out of court before we even came close to a trial. Um, these defenses, there were numerous defenses, but the main ones were arguing that Sri Lanka was a more viable jurisdiction, that we had to exhaust remedies in Sri Lanka, um, and then also that uh, Gotapaya Rajapaksa, because of his official position at the time the attacks were occurring, um, he had official acts immunity, what we refer to as common law immunity. We were litigating these, um, these initial defenses, uh, and then the Easter Sunday attacks occurred in Sri Lanka. Uh, following that, Gotabaya Rajapaksa um, announced that he would be running for president. He tried to get the case uh, delayed until after the election, saying that it was interfering with his ability to run for president, um, but the judge did not grant that delay. Um, however, he was elected uh, president later that year, and because of that, and because we were in a national court, he was given absolute immunity as a head of state. So we weren't allowed to proceed with our civil suit. It was dismissed without prejudice, which means that it can be filed again once his immunity is lifted. Um, but that's the limitations we have uh, working in national court systems. This isn't a limitation that would exist um, before an international court or an international criminal court. Yeah. What is the current status of the pending litigation? So because Rajapaksa is still president, um, you know, and the case was dismissed, 
he still has head of state immunity. We wouldn't be able to refile the case until that head of state immunity is lifted. And we also would need jurisdiction over Rajapaksa to proceed. Um, and I understand that you have a pending UN communication as well. Um, can you walk us through the objectives? What, what are you trying to achieve or hoping to achieve through the UN communication? Yeah, after our case was dismissed, uh, we had collected, you know, years worth of evidence. A lot of investigation had gone into this case. Um, we didn't want it to be for naught. Uh, so we decided to assist Ahimsa in filing an individual communication before the Human Rights Committee, alleging that La Santa had several of his rights violated under the International Convention for Civil and Political Rights, uh, namely his right to life, his right to be free from torture, um, his right for free expression, and also Ahimsa's right to a, a remedy. And we detailed in the complaint not only the things that we had alleged in our civil suit, arguing that Gotabaya Rajapaksa was a commander in charge of the uh, military intelligence unit that was responsible for the death of also brought up all the interference that we witnessed um, from the government side that prevented the case from moving forward within Sri Lanka. This was heavily detailed as part of our argument that Sri Lanka wasn't offering victims a right to a remedy. Um, and this interference was touched upon by Nishanta De Silva, um, but some of this included things like evidence being confiscated, um, a notebook in which Lasanta had been um, writing down the license plate numbers of motorcyclists had been destroyed, um, and also when, you know, Investigators such as Nishanta would seek to interrogate certain individuals within the Tripoli platoon. Those individuals would be transferred out of the country, so they were out of reach of criminal investigators. Um, it became clear that an investigation couldn't move forward while the Rajapaksas were in power. And even after they were removed from power, the Sirisena government also did not um, really provide a viable option for accountability for victims either. And that's heavily detailed in our complaint. We also do lay out some of the attacks that occurred. <laughs> we also laid out some of the attacks that occurred against other journalists showing the pattern of violence that was happening against other journalists at the time. And because the Rajapaksas are now back in power, uh, we also identified some of the resurgence of violence against journalists, some of the chilling effects that were happening, the self-censorship um, that had occurred under the previous administration were now uh, returning. Could you share with us your perspective on the current situation uh, with the protests in Sri Lanka? and how this may lead to some new avenues opening up for accountability or reform of some nature. Well, of course, the protests in Sri Lanka um, are mostly linked to the economic crisis that's occurring, but also for a failure of faith in government. And I think that failure of faith in government really happens when you have pervasive impunity for crimes such as this, when you have the murder of a beloved journalist, um, where there's been an international outcry calling for justice, tenacity of the families calling for justice for over a decade, and the government um, does not provide that kind of accountability. People lose faith in the ability of the government to actually govern and protect its